Good morning, everyone, um, and um, welcome to this webinar. I should say good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us for today's discussion on challenges and strategies for monitoring and evaluation in the time of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Maya Person. I am the Communications and Knowledge Management Advisor for IDEAL, the organizer of today's event. And I'm joining you from my home in Maryland, a little bit north of Washington, D.C., sitting in my basement as close to our internet router as possible. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Lloyd. Uh, hi, Lloyd. How are you today? Hi, Maya. Hi, uh, hi, all of you joining. We're, we're so excited to see the uh, attendance numbers continue to grow. Uh, I'm sitting here uh, just down the road from Maya uh, in Minnesota, <laughs> uh, outside of St. Paul. It's slightly earlier here than in D.C., but I have small children, so I've already been up for three or four hours. Um, my small children are also my new work colleagues, which I'm sure is... Uh, an experience that everybody on the room can can uh, align with at some level. We all have new work colleagues in our homes and our work from home orders. Um, but yes, I'm uh, again Lloyd Banwart. I'm the monitoring, evaluation, and research advisor. And uh, I just specifically want to thank the currently 287 people and growing on on this call. And um, for taking the time to to log in this morning. Yes, it's wonderful to see so many online. Uh, we're now up in 300 attendees online uh, in this webinar, and we actually had uh, 1,200 registrants for the event. So uh, it's clear that this is this is different, definitely a, a, a topic in high demand to talk about right now. Um, so in case we reach the maximum number of 500, which is all that this Zoom platform will allow, um, we will send out a message to anyone who gets rejected to join. And of course, after the webinar, the recording and all materials will be distributed to all registrants. Yeah. Um, and like me, I'm sure you know, many of you have been working from home for the last few weeks and as a result are now uh, completely proficient Zoom experts. But uh, for those of us that are a, a little less techno savvy, I, I, I'm finding myself in that camp um, with each growing year of age. Uh, we just want to go over a few of the, the basic workings of Zoom and, and how we hope you can utilize it to have a more uh, engaged uh, experience today. Um, to begin with, we would love for all attendees to complete the poll. You would have seen that when you first logged in. Uh, there's a number of questions, so please answer each one, and you do have to scroll to get to the bottom of the questions. Uh, answer those. Once you hit submit, it will disappear from your screen for now, and in just a bit, we'll go over those poll results with all of us together in the room. So I'm seeing uh, in the chat box that some people have difficulty seeing the video of us. I still hope that our sound is coming through clearly, uh, which is the more important thing. Um, while after, after submitting that poll, it would be wonderful if you would like to introduce yourselves in the chat box, just put your name and organization so everybody online can get a sense of um, who is uh, joining us online because this is the zoom webinar feature we can't see uh, attendees can't see each other so it's nice just to put that in the chat box and everybody can get a sense of who's online and, and along if you're not able to see us there are some zoom options if you hover kind of in the top right window of where you may see names right now there's a gallery view a, a speaker view these are customized for each of your own experiences. So toggle between those and that may, may uh, be a solution to not being able to see Maya or I's video as well. Um, so in addition to the chat box that we hope you're all, I see everybody's introducing themselves, it's great. Uh, briefly, you're, you're also gonna see a Q&A box, which if you hover over the bottom of your Zoom window, 
you'll see this Q and A. Um, we really encourage all of you to use this today uh, a lot as our different colleagues share their field experiences. Um, the great thing about uh, Zoom's Q and A box is that if you agree with a question, you can upvote it. And so questions that get more upvotes filter to the top. It allows us to prioritize those for the for our colleagues that are sharing their their field experiences to address or answer. But you know, answering those questions are not just limited to those of us that are sharing today via video. Um, there is a wealth of monitoring and evaluation knowledge and experience in this room. Uh, we're now at 432 people. Um, please. Uh, if you know an answer or have advice or an experience, chime into those questions, provide your input. Really, we want that to be a, a really active dialogue between all of you that are participating today and leverage that. And we will be sharing that uh, afterwards with, with all participants so that hopefully we can all, you know, learn from each other. Yeah. That's great. Um, and to add uh, around the, the tech or, uh, for this webinar, if you have difficulties, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can send a message just to the panelists uh, and uh, our colleagues on Ideal, Julia and Kim, will be happy to help you out with any problems you may have throughout. Um, uh, right, so yes, please answer each other's questions, comment, and um, we will soon introduce our panelists, our presenters for uh, today's webinar, and they will also be helping to answer your questions, both in that Q&A box and also verbally, because we'll have a Q&A session uh, after each presentation. Um, and as I said before, we will be sharing all this, all this afterwards. All right, Lloyd, do you wanna go take us through today's agenda? Sure. Um, well, quickly before we get into today's agenda, I, I want to level with the with all of our participants. Um, we put this uh, event together eight days ago uh, out of some consultations with uh, some food security actors uh, that are consortium members of of Ideal. And you know, frankly, I expected maybe fifty to sixty participants, maybe a hundred registrants, and half of those people would show up. Um, and the interest in this event far exceeded our expectations. And so we had originally planned some small group breakout rooms to workshop specific ideas. Now that quickly went out the window when we started getting five, six, seven hundred registrants to the event. So we've had to do some uh, adaptive management, some adaptive planning of, of the agenda. Um, but we're doing it hopefully in a way that uh, it keeps all of you engaged. And I, I just hope that everyone leaves this event with a greater understanding of the m &E challenges that your fellow colleagues and practitioners are facing during co this COVID-19 pandemic that, that we're all daily adjusting to. And I hope each of you have heard at least one thing or read one thing in the chat box around potential strategies that may help you and your organization address some of the challenges that you and your teams are facing. Um, if, if those two things happen, I think it's, it's a win. Um, so to walk through today's lineup, it, 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 it's fairly straightforward and, and direct. Um, just in a moment here, we're going to get into three, uh, three of our colleagues from organizations from IRC, Save the Children, and uh, IAPS are going to share some actual field experiences of how they've been real time uh, uh, modifying m and &E and the struggles they're facing and how they're adapting their strategies in light of COVID-19. And following each of those, we're gonna allow for about a 10 minute window of Q&A, some interaction with, the, with participants online. Um, after those three kind of uh, sharing follow Q&A sessions, we'll talk about next steps and what that means and, and move on with our mornings. Um, so, Really looking forward to it. I'm gonna uh, eager to get started, so I'm gonna ha hand it over to, to you, Maya. Yeah. So before we dig in, uh, I'm just gonna give you a quick, quick overview of Ideal, the organizer of today's event. Uh, for you who are not familiar with us, um, we are an activity funded by USAID's Office of Food for Peace. 
Uh, we are a five-year activity and we're now in our year two of implementation. Uh, it's a consortium, so led by Save the Children and joined by the Kaizen Company, Mercy Corps, and Tango International. Uh, our goal is improved overall effectiveness of Food for Peace funded development and emergency food security activities. And we work through four pathways or um, sort of type of activities, including capacity strengthening, small grants, stakeholder consultations, uh, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So these are all ways that we help implementers uh, become more effective and um, also help implementers share with each other uh, all the all the, the the knowledge that that we know they have so all this to to try and improve uh, programming and the effectiveness of programming in both development and emergency activities if you have more if you want to know more about ideal uh, and our activities please visit uh, the FSN Network, Food Security and Nutrition Network. That's fsnnetwork.org. Um, and under the About section, you can find IDEAL, and you can also find other mechanisms that we collaborate closely with, uh, funded by USAID as well. So I encourage you to go to that website and check it out. Um, and now that's it for me. Um, from me for now. Over to you, Lloyd. Great. So as part of the registration for this, we uh, got a lot of information from the registrants, all of you in the room, and also from um, those, unfortunately, that aren't able to make it because we're now at, uh, we're at capacity at 510 attendees. Um, before we dig, and, and, I, and I just want to take, you know, five minutes to share high level results from that. But before we do that, maybe we can dig into some of our poll results a little bit and just see in general who's here, uh, what type of M&E work they're doing, where they're from. And so you should all have the poll results pop up on your screen at any time during the, this event. You're just, you know, hover over the bottom of your window. You can see polls, click that, and you can, you know, review this. But we have a pretty good distribution of attendees across, uh, across the different regions of the world. Uh, the only region that we're really missing out on right now is Oceana, and uh, and there's eight participants from Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, Europe and North America are are really dominating there with almost 150 from each. Um, so for those you know that are in other regions, perhaps they had issues with time zones or connectivity. We will absolutely be making sure they get audio or uh, and video recordings of this event with all of the materials. Um, we also were really interested in what type of organizations you you represent of the, those that would show up. You know, uh, 1,200 people isn't viral per internet terminology, but for those of us on Ideal who work in food security, 1,200 registrants is probably the closest to viral or popular that uh, I'll ever be in my role. And so I was wondering if it made it outside of uh, food security in general um, or even outside of development in general, but it looks like primarily most of us online are uh, international NGOs with a number of private sector firms, some bilateral donors, um, academia, research organizations. Um, and the overwhelming amount of individuals are working in either human, emergency or humanitarian m and &E or international development m and &E. And there's, uh, what is that? Almost 100 folks are working uh, uh, aligned with research monitoring and evaluation. And, and lastly, we were interested in, in where folks heard from it. So uh, heard about the event because it, it did get a, a greater response than Ideals had for any of our previous events. So it looks like there's a high other. Wish there was an other specify. So if, if those of you who hit other really would be interested uh, if you could highlight in the, in, the chat, in the chat room what that other was. We would love to hear about that. Uh, and just know what other channels uh, these types of uh, events are, are distributed through. So maybe we can focus on those in the future. All right, I'm gonna close these polls now and just briefly go over the results or the, the feedback you all had from when you registered. Uh, 
there uh, here's a word cloud that you know the bigger the the bigger the country name the more registrants as of friday when we pulled this data there was just uh, around 500 registrants so this wasn't the complete data set but what we had is 71 countries represented as of friday so we're really getting a a, a good representation global representation and as of friday again there was 158 organizations so we're cutting across a number of uh organizations of small, large, medium, and, and sectors. Uh, next slide, please, Julia. And one of the questions that we asked you as you registered were, what are the challenges uh, related to ME that you're facing as a result of COVID-19? So we went through those, you know, those 1,200 responses, and we really did our best to, to code and consolidate those into some type of meaningful um, aggregate. and Far and behold, the, the most cited thing was access for on-site data collection and monitoring. And so what that means, for example, is thing, there's questions specifically around post-distribution monitoring, um, how to or if we should conduct household surveys, convening of focus group discussions. And a lot of, a lot of these were all written uh, with a note around the concern about maintaining, maintaining data quality as well as, as we adapt to these mechanisms. Um, the next was around program, like what does m &E do in, in the wake of program uh, implementation being delayed or canceled or, or modified? Um, equally, uh, what about uh, existing assessments and evaluations that are delayed or canceled? Uh, and adjusting programs that are responding to COVID-19. So how, are, how is m &E best uh, addressing or, or changing their what they do specifically around needs assessments um, and how to best serve participants uh, in light of COVID-19 that might be most vulnerable or, or be more vulnerable. Um, another key theme coming out and maybe uh, one that's been highlighted elsewhere in the sector, there's been some excellent webinars this last week around the use of phone and digital data collection. Um, and this is, uh, around like challenges around ethics, connectivity, sampling bias, survey design, data quality. Um, next slide, please. So some, some pull, key quotes we pulled out were in urban areas or contexts where participants have had access to phones um, and we can conduct surveys remotely, documenting informed consent is challenging. Uh, the additional workload for adapting existing mechanisms for routine ME as well as building mechanisms for COVID-19 related monitoring. Uh, two slides ahead, please, Julia. And one more. And next was we asked how organizations are currently adapting its ME as a result of COVID-19. And, and many organizations are at different places here. Uh, that uh, Some organizations are looking at adapting policy, some organizations are looking at just getting tips out to their staff. Uh, the, the really the top four was using remote data collection and monitoring. So moving away from in-person, um, conducting phone interviews. Um, a lot of organizations just said, we're not sure yet. The discussions are ongoing, which is very much why we're having this conversation uh, today. Um, and then reducing or reprioritizing m and &E activities. And specifically what this got to, what a number of the responses was, how do we focus on only what's essential? Uh, next slide, please. So some of the quotes from this are, taking advantage of this slowdown in activities to focus on training, guidance, capacity building in general. Uh, we're work recommending usage of online platforms for client feedback where feasible. Next slide, please. Looking to reduce scope, use more remote data collection methods and make the use of monitoring data already collected rather than collecting new evaluation data. And prioritizing phone-based data collection and request program teams to collect beneficiary cell phone numbers during registration when applicable. There's a lot of information here. We're going to share all of this in a, in a packaged format after the, after the series with you all. But just to kind of give you a, an idea of what people's priorities were coming into this event. Maya, over to you. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, 
It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker from the IRC. Simon Fuchs is the m and &E Advisor for Economic Recovery and Development Programs at the International Rescue Committee, IRC, a global humanitarian response organization. Uh, Simon has worked in m and &E for development and humanitarian assistance projects for over 10 years and has a master's in economics from the University of Warwick in the UK. Hi, Simon, if you can turn on your camera, that will be perfect. And you hear me? thank you so much. Take it away. Um, I just want to confirm my, can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thanks everyone for, for joining the call. This is definitely the largest audience that I've ever presented to on a monitoring and evaluation technical topic before. Um, and uh, the example that I'm going to be discussing today is from uh, IRC's uh, cash, uh, uh, humanitarian assistance program for uh, Venezuelan refugees in Colombia. Uh, but before I get into the example, just a little bit of background about IRC. Uh, international Rescue Committee is an international humanitarian response and uh, recovery organization. Um, and we also have an arm of our organization that does uh, refugee resettlement in the United States. Um, our headquarters is in New York, which is uh, where I'm, I'm joining the call from. Um, and our monitoring and evaluation support structure as an organization is kind of as follows. We have a, a global measurement unit, um, which sort of sets standards and provides uh, guidance and support or as a global level. Um, and then monitoring and evaluation advisors for each of our major sectors. Uh, I'm the, the advisor for the economic recovery and development. Um, uh, portfolio of, of projects, uh, and I have counterparts in education, health, and, uh, and protection. Um, and, uh, and then we have at uh, our regional offices and country level uh, offices, we have uh, monitoring and evaluation coordinators as well. Um, so I'm not going to go through in detail uh, the, the guidance that, that IRC is, is giving in a lot. I think it's very similar to what a lot of other organizations, uh, Mercy Corps and SAVE and, and so on, are providing in terms of general principles for uh, adapting monitoring and evaluation for COVID. Uh, but very briefly, because I'm the first presenter, um, the, first, the first principle for us is do no harm. Um, and that applies to our staff and, uh, and clients well-being, and, and that's our number one priority uh, you know, in, in this whole situation. Uh, after that, then we want to ensure that we're following all the relevant government regulations and IRC's country policy in the, uh, the context in which we're operating. And then uh, with, with those two things in mind, uh, we are, we're kind of, um, we, we are triaging our, our monitoring and evaluation activities and our programming uh, according to the UN's program criticality framework. So that's what PC uh, stands for here. Uh, so PC1 and 2 are, are life-saving, and I, I can't remember what PC2 is, but, uh, you know, it's essentially like very, very critical forms of, of support. Uh, and so for those, those critical types of, of program activities, uh, where possible, we're shifting to remote monitoring practices. Um, and if it's not possible to shift to remote monitoring, in other words, if, if physical monitoring is required and uh, is, is permitted by the government regulations and IRC country policy in, in that country, uh, then we want to ensure that we're always following uh, the, the relevant health and safety procedures uh, for, um, for COVID. Uh, for non-critical activities, uh, we're, we're pausing monitoring altogether at the moment. Um, and uh, and it, just as a general sort of rule, we're trying to communicate as much as possible with our funders, our staff, the communities, uh, and, and of course the beneficiaries of the project about any changes that we're making, um, and kind of as, as, as early as possible in, in this whole uh, process, trying to carry everyone along. So uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so as noted, the example I'm going to use is a, a, was a pre-existing uh, cash program for uh, Venezuelan refugees in, in, in northern Colombia. Uh, IRC is part of the uh, co Collaborative Cash Delivery uh, Consortium in, in Colombia, uh, along with SAVE, Mercy Corps, and World Vision. Um, and the program, under normal circumstances, provides six months of transfers for uh, new arrivals to, to Colombia from Venezuela. 
using prepaid and ATM cards, uh, which are uh, the, the payment provider is a large national uh, bank. And for the monitoring and evaluation and kind of data management side of, of this project, we're using uh, a, a mobile data collection software called ComCare, which is similar to uh, open data kit uh, based programs uh, for registration and, and, uh, and follow up monitoring and evaluation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Just a bit of context about uh, COVID in Colombia. There are uh, approximately, or there were uh, two days ago when I put these numbers in here, uh, there were 800 cases, uh, confirmed cases in Colombia. Uh, Colombia has uh, 5,000 ICU beds. So uh, relative to a lot of contexts where IRC is operating, uh, Colombia's healthcare system is, uh, is highly developed. Um, and they started a national lockdown on, uh, on March 20th. So uh, about uh, 10 or 11 days ago. Um, and, and for uh, based on the, the program criticality framework of the UN, cash and food assistance is considered to be uh, level one life-saving assistance. Um, so we are doing everything possible in this circumstance to continue the, the, the program because of it's, it's, uh, it, it's rated as, as, uh, as a critical life-saving program. Uh, next slide. Um, so just some general challenges, which I think will be familiar to, to everyone in this, uh, in, on this call already. Uh, there's a very rapid upheaval taking place all over the world as a result of COVID. So we had very little time to prepare, um, particularly early in the, in the, the kind of uh, global spread of the virus. Uh, messaging was really inconsistent and the, the kind of response was inconsistent, both between different governments uh, IRC as well was having a little bit of difficulty kind of coordinating and, and managing its, its own internal messaging. And the lives of our staff and beneficiaries are directly impacted by this. Uh, you know, uh, many of our staff are, are, were already at the, you know, kind of under some form of movement restriction or bracing themselves and trying to prepare their, their families and, and loved ones for, uh, you know, the anticipated, um, uh, you know, effects of the virus. Um, and at the time that, that the work that I'm about to describe was, was underway, uh, a national shelter in place order was imminent and it has now been put in place. Um, and the other kind of challenge was that our, our normal way of operating in this particular program involved a lot of co physical contact points, uh, both the eligibility screening, site monitoring, uh, client feedback and, and post distribution monitoring, all were done in person. Um, as well as the distribution of ATM cards, uh, the, the, the beneficiaries going to visit the ATM and, uh, and then going to spend the cash, all involve physical contact. So we're, we're looking to now uh, pivot to minimize these, these points. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the remote communication and access to information uh, is certainly better in Colombia than it would be in a lot of other IRC contexts, but still limited. And in, in particular, there, there was a divide between uh, the level of access that, that male and female beneficiaries had, as well as, uh, you know, uh, people who, communities who were in uh, the urban area of Cucuta, um, as opposed to uh, people who were in kind of slightly further out, more far flung uh, locations. Uh, next slide. Um, and so these are the adaptations that, uh, that the, the team in Colombia put into place. Um, the first one, uh, well, the first several ones were actually programmatic things. So the, the first thing that they did was they, they combined multiple tranches of cash uh, distributions into a single transfer. Um, this is in order to reduce contact points uh, with the beneficiaries. The second is that they moved the distribution date forward so that that particular distribution occurred ahead of the, the, the restriction on, on uh, movement, which is now in place. Um, the third one, which was an existing feature of this program, was electronic top-up of the ATM cards. Okay, I'm being told I have two minutes, so I'm going to speed through here. Um, for the distribution, they staggered the arrival of beneficiaries through the day, provided personal protective equipment and hand-washing stations, uh, in terms of remote monitoring, we've shifted to, to uh, entirely to phone surveys and abbreviated, like shortened the length of those surveys to include just the critical questions in order to reduce the likelihood of people dropping off of phone surveys. Um, 
The only type of monitoring that we continued to do in person was having a representative from the monitoring and evaluation team during, at present during the distribution of ATM cards to new beneficiaries. This is because there was no physical contact involved and the distribution already required an in-person interaction between IRC staff and, uh, and the beneficiaries. We also used the bulk SMS features of the, the ComCare uh, monitoring and evaluation system to communicate COVID messages and share the hotline number so that uh, beneficiaries of the program were aware of where they could, could uh, go for questions and, and feedback. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's some pictures of the, uh, the, the distributions taking place. Very bizarre for anyone who's, who's done uh, catch programming before, uh, not to see a crowd of people anywhere, um, but there you go. Uh, next slide. Um, and the success factors. And I think this is the, the hard part for me is that these don't exist everywhere. So first of all, the IRC Columbia team, to their credit, really, really adaptable and acted very fast. We had a flexible funder, uh, in this case, uh, the, the USAID, um, and the, the IRC team in general was open to changing their normal procedures uh, rapidly to respond to this. Uh, we had digital systems already in place for the cash transfers and m and &E data collection and management, and mobile penetration and technology literacy is high for both men and women. As noted, there is some discrepancy here between the males and, and females in the program, but not as much as, as we would expect to see in some other IRC contexts. Uh, this was also a smaller scale project, so it was only serving several hundred households per, per month. Um, I imagine this would be very difficult to, to, to manage uh, when you're talking about thousands or tens of thousands. Uh, and there was really great coordination between the cash team, the program team, and the M&E team. I think that's probably the thing that we can emulate the most in other places is having and uh, not have working in silos and, and coordinating really well together. Um, so next slide. Uh, in terms of the, the unknowns and, and, and questions that I have, there are many. Um, but the first one is how to manage staff uh, risk and well-being. The staff in this program were all willing to kind of uh, to, 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 to engage uh, with the, the beneficiaries uh, in, in person. But, uh, you know, that, that's obviously a matter of personal preference and, and risk tolerance. Um, how do we proceed when the success factors are not in place? Uh, you know, so many of those things that I mentioned on the previous slide don't exist in a lot of IRC contexts. Um, how do we manage the survey administration by phone? Um, and, uh, and, and particularly, I'm concerned with how we manage gender in, in, inequity in terms of access to information and access to technology in, um, in, you know, across the board. Um, and I had some, some resources that I was going to share, but um, uh, I'll, I'll be sharing them, uh, I guess, after the, the webinar. But uh, just to highlight that the, the JPAL's uh, best practices for phone surveys is a, a truly an excellent webinar and, and just a really good summary of, uh, because so much of what we're, we're doing at IRC is now gonna be phone survey dependent, um, it, it's a really, really good resource, just uh, provides very practical tips about um, managing response rate, getting informed consent and, and things of that nature. Um, so IRC has some, some COVID guidance, M&E guidance that, that uh, we'll be sharing out later, but uh, apparently the, the, the link in my original presentation was broken. So uh, thanks. And, um, and I guess we'll see uh, what, the, what the questions are. Yeah, thanks so much, Simon. I, uh, for sure. Thanks for sharing. Uh, there's, some, there's some good questions coming up, and I also encourage those of you listening, please pose your questions to the, uh, to the Q&A box and, and upvote. There's, there's one that I thought was really poignant for your presentation, and that is from, from Mark Cowell. He says, you know, how do the COVID challenges facing short-term basic needs focused humanitarian assistant m and &E differ from those facing large volume, longer term multi-sectoral development assistance m and &E? And then he states, it seems to me that the tools used in remote data collection uh, used in humanitarian assistance for hard to read settings have suddenly become more relevant. Uh, could you speak a bit about that in terms of how your feelings and your experience with, with IRC? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so as noted, this is a basic needs, this particular project is a basic needs uh, sort of humanitarian assistance type uh, of, of, of program. 
So uh, we already are kind of accustomed to operating in a context where, uh, you know, where the, the, the population oftentimes is mobile. Um, and so they're, they're not staying in one uh, location. It, it, you know, they, they are, they're displaced. Um, and so uh, things like getting the contact information of people and, um, and having uh, trying to, to sort of phone, form kind of like phone trees or other informal networks uh, in order to communicate with, with our, our clients is something that IRC is really accustomed to. I think it's probably one of the most important things, like a success factor that we have anywhere where we're working is having really effective uh, local partner organizations. Um, in, in this particular instance, there are a number of local partner organizations that essentially kind of refer um, refer new arrivals to IRC. So I would say to, to the, the, the greatest extent possible, um, you know, uh, reinforcing your relationships with, with local organizations is, is really key. Uh, and then in terms of the, the monitoring and evaluation tools, I think Frankly, the biggest difference that I've seen having worked in humanitarian assistance and development projects is just brevity. Um, you cannot administer a, uh, an, a, an, an hour and a half long um, baseline survey in person or even a 45 minute long survey in, that when you administer it in person takes an hour and a half to two hours over the phone. That's completely infeasible in, in, under normal circumstances for IRC. So for us, that's not as big of a change. But for those of you who are doing research uh, programs or, or whatever and are accustomed to, to being able to, uh, you know, have your enumerators and your data collectors sit down with, with respondents for lengthy periods of time uh, in person, I think you're going to really have to think hard about, uh, about data minimization and about economizing uh, the, the amount of uh, questions that you're collecting. And for us, the challenge of this is that oftentimes we're collecting the data that we're collecting is driven by the requirements of the donor of the project. Um, and so one of the things that we had to do as part of this adjustment to this project was communicate with our funder um, to indicate to them that, uh, you know, that, that we're, we're going to be shortening and reducing the amount of data collection that we're doing uh, and changing our uh, eligibility screening process um, to, to, to make it more feasible to do uh, over the phone. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's a there's a there's a follow up question, and I think that's really pertinent to that, and especially those many people working in in more non permissive settings, as well as uh, from Stephanie Fisher, stating, "I was just wondering whether all beneficiaries already had mobile phones, and are they all literate, or is there an ability to undertake phone surveys using audio?" Uh, and I and I think, given time, this will probably be the last question we can pose for you at the moment. Um, but yeah, if you could address that, that would, that would, I think, be really helpful, too, in this context. Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we're going to have in translating this approach to other countries, is that in the context of Colombia, uh, the vast majority of the, the, the clients have uh, their own mobile phones, and um, I, I think pretty much 100% of them are, are, illiterate in, are literate in Spanish. Um, so when we look to translate this to other places, um, when I say phone surveys, that we are we are calling people and administering it's a computer assisted telephone interview, technically speaking, uh, rather than um, SMS or uh, uh, IVR, like a um, kind of automated voice uh, recognition system. Um, so part of the reason why we're doing that is is because that's. Uh, that that process requires the lowest level of has a, I would say the least requirement for uh, technological literacy um, uh, of all the different options. They just need to have a phone and be able to speak the language of the person administering the 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 the, the phone survey. We're still trying to work out what to do about the. Uh, credit because uh, you know phone credit is a big deal to uh, you know the, the amount of phone credit that you would use to have a half an hour phone conversation. Um, we're still trying to figure out a way to compensate the the beneficiaries uh, after the fact for the phone credit uh, that it costs them to to talk to us. Great. Um, uh, 
Thank you so much, Simon. I'm going to hand it over to Maya in just one second. I want to highlight for all participants, uh, just as a reminder, if you hover your mouse over the lower side of, of your Zoom window, uh, a number of options should pop up. One of those will be a Q&A box. Um, so if you're not finding the Q&A box, that's where you would select it. It's going to be a pop-up box that comes out. You can pose questions, but we also encourage all of you to jump in there and start answering our colleagues' questions as well. Um, all you got to do is type answer, and just because you type an answer, that's just starting a dialogue for all of us to learn from our own experience. So please don't be shy or bashful about answering questions that you feel you have some experience to contribute to. Um, that is the purpose of us having 509 people on the room together to kind of learn from one another. Uh, Maya, over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, and thank you, Lloyd. Uh, well, we're now moving over to Save the Children. Um, Alexandra Guzman is the National Meal Coordinator for the Multipurpose multi Cash Plus Assistance Program to Vulnerable Venezuelans in Peru. It's a joint OFDA Food for Peace funded award implemented by Save the Children. Alexander holds a Master in International Cooperation, uh, Cooperation by the University of Montpellier in France, and she has monitored projects over the last five years. Thank you so much for joining us, Alexandra. I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Maya. Um, yes, just like Maya mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about a multipurpose cash plus assistance to vulnerable Venezuelans in Peru. Um, this uh, project started in April of last year, 2019, and goes to um, June 2020. So just a bit of context about the project. Um, as you may know, um, Venezuela's deteriorating economic and political situation has brought in hyperinflation, elevated, elevated levels of unemployment and food shortages, and this has increased migration flows out of Venezuela since 2015, mostly into Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. So just like Simon uh, just uh, talked, talked to us about the Colombia also context. And this program uh, responds to that crisis through an integrated multipurpose cash transfer intervention. So um, as you can read in the presentation, the goal is to provide emergency assistance to vulnerable and at-risk Venezuelan migrants in Peru to cover their basic needs and promote their inclusion into the local economy and society while preventing development of negative coping strategies. And I'm monitoring the project. I'm based in, in Lima, in Peru. And well, I, I mentioned the duration of the program. It goes up to June of this year. And this is a joint of the Food for Peace funded award that targets uh, 37,404 Venezuelans. And um, the program uh, well, searches for um, vulnerable migrants located in urban areas, such as Lima, Pura, Lambayeque, La Libertad, and Arequipa. And this is key also to understand that uh, our targets are located in urban areas. And the intervention, as I mentioned, is a multipurpose cash assistance with complementary plus nutrition and child protection activities. Um, the households um, reaching Peru and transiting through border cities benefit from a transition transit package in order to help them reach their final destination without um, having to resort to negative coping strategies. And households that are settling in cities receive a settlement package assistance in order to support them starting a new life. Um, so while the transit households receive one transfer, settlement households may receive up to three transfers. And this is something important to mention also that the transit families can also receive later on a settlement package. And regarding the selection criteria, um, back to the previous, um, yeah, thank you. So the selection criteria I'm seeing on, on a question, um, we target vulnerable Venezuelan migrant households such as single-headed, female-headed households with pregnant or lactating women, persons with disabilities, elderly persons, uh, persons sleeping in public spaces, 
And households with RCSI scores consistent with a phase of three or above, this is RCSI, this is an indicator um, managed by Food for Peace. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, in order to find our potential beneficiaries, cash promoters, which are the enumerators, go out to various Venezuelans' hotspots such as bus stations, informal and formal shelters, dining halls, and markets to find and interview Venezuelan uh, migrants. And once then, then they find them, the targeting survey is filled out, which automatically calculates a vulnerability score and determines eligibility. Then um, eligible individuals are informed by phone and given logistics information for date and place for registration and distribution. So um, how is the data collected? Next slide, yes. So uh, the selection survey, um, but also the registration baseline and post-distribution monitoring service are collected through standardized COBO forms, which are applied using Android tablets. Uh, so this helps us a lot, uh, the COBO forms, because, because we use advanced calculation functions in COBO to auto-calculate indicators, such as I mentioned RCSI or household hunger scale, and this saves time and ensures quality consistency of analysis. And who collects the data? Um, also, the selection, the registration, the baseline are conducted by the same enumerators, the cash promoters, and the data is then validated by the meal officers for their respective regions. Uh, regarding the PDM service, these are conducted by the meal staff by phone, and this is due to the high cell phone ownership among migrants and the transit nature of the population. So this will also be key for the challenges that we are facing ahead. Next slide, please. Uh, so what are what are the challenges that are we are facing? So the first case of COVID appeared on March 6, and only 10 days later, on March 16th, the government prohibited movement and the schools and markets were closed. So taking action for Peru was very important because Peru doesn't have a strong capacity in terms of health and we have for example just 852 beds in the intensive care units so very little um, comparing to what just Simon mentioned and comparing comparing with the capacity in Colombia and um, so at the same time this happened the the restrictions we decided to suspend also implementation of our activities in the field say the children gives two approaches for this for preparedness and adaptation, which are the first one to try to shift to more report support and meal, and the second one trying to delay less critical or time-sensitive meal exercises. And these are guidelines that are proposed by Save the Children through a COVID-19 and meal document that was sent to all the offices. So what we decided in the program, we decided to shift to more remote meal support for activities that typically require face-to-face -face interaction. So remote working is possible for our following activities that you can read in the presentation, the selection, the registration, the PDM, PDM and the accountability mechanisms. And also we are looking for doing an evaluation uh, with um, more, remote, more remote work. So how we have adapted to these challenges. So for the selection of beneficiaries, we have set up an online form where potential beneficiaries can provide their contact information and then we can contact them and apply the targeting survey. As I said, due to the high cell phone ownership among migrants and the disponible availability of internet, this is possible. I'm going to show you later on uh, what the online platform looks like. Um, then we have also previously combined selection and registration processes of beneficiaries in one day and this is a great way to save time and we also think that it's possible to conduct via phone the selection. We are considering providing settlement packages to recipients of transit assistance and this is because they already have a debit card to do the 
and we can do the cash transfer very easily without going to the field. And as I mentioned, this, this, we have done this before. We have assisted um, transit beneficiaries as later on as settlement beneficiaries. And previously, uh, we would have to call them and to ask them if they still hold the card because be many beneficiaries um, lose the card. Uh, we are also encouraging referrals by partners and other organizations. So as I mentioned, normally enumerators go to bus stations, informal, formal shelters to find potential beneficiaries. So getting referrals by partners would, would make the selection process for new families more accessible. Regarding the registration and distribution, as soon as we can go to the field, we are planning to reduce personnel and number of beneficiaries at distribution per government directive. Also, as Simon mentioned, we, we also follow the government directives and we also have the principle to do no harm to our staff. So this will be something we will keep in mind. We have launched a WhatsApp channel on the same day of the, that the government prohibited movement. In addition to the, to the email we already had uh, for complaint and feedback management. So this new channel, the WhatsApp channel, gives us, allows us to provide current beneficiary communities and partners with information on limitations of uh, our current activities. And we also have the chance to sensitize to the sensitization via WhatsApp. And this has the objective to help beneficiaries stay informed on COVID-19 and the resources that are available to them. I'm also going to show you next what this WhatsApp channel looks like. And also uh, we have the final evaluation ahead in um, the, at the end of May and June. So we are preparing to collect quantitative data by phone. Our enumerators are already trained to do this a collection of information by phone. As I mentioned, the PDM already has been going on by phone. And we may delay or omit qualitative portion and include questions about COVID's impact on the households. Um, we are maintaining an open dialogue, a regular dialogue with donors and the MLTAs also on the operational context on its on constraints. Uh, so flexibility and communication are key in this context. So here I wanted you to show you the communications on Save the Children's website and also um, these images that we sent through WhatsApp to families that ask for information. Uh, I'm aware this is in Spanish, but I'm, I will tell you what it says briefly. So the first image, in the first image, we are communicating, communicating to the suspension of implementation of activities. We give them information about our website, our WhatsApp number. We also encourage them to update their contact information if they already are beneficiaries. And uh, we wrote the number they can call if they are having symptoms, the hotline, and you can find also there the number of the Red Cross. And in the second image, we are showing relevant information as what organizations are supporting the, the Venezuelan migrants and this was elaborated by UNHCR, UNHCR that is our uh, we also communicate very frequently with them uh, it shows the organizations that give support in certain subjects like how to denounce violence to take precautions with their health so in the next uh, image um, in this slide as I mentioned, we, we have an online form that beneficiaries or potential beneficiaries can fill their contact information on. So um, in Spanish, it says, what can I do on this website? So first of all, they can enter their contact information if they aren't beneficiaries yet. And second, they all can also update their contact information if they changed their phone number. So, in the third column, you can see that they can choose the region and they can enter their information. And right now also indicates that the online form is suspended until we decide to open it very soon and allow to benefit new families in the field. In this slide, you can find uh, how our WhatsApp channel works. 
So as I mentioned, on the same day the government gave the restrictions of movement, we launched this WhatsApp channel. We were already preparing for this. And so the potential beneficiary or already beneficiary can send us a message at this WhatsApp number. And we have automatic messages. So first we mentioned that activities are now suspended and they can, we mentioned also the website and then we can, we ask them to type a word. For example, here the person writes report and then we send them the numbers where they can report some kind of violence. And we also encourage them to update their contact information or they can ask about the program with a different word. Uh, so since March 16th, we have reached more than 1,000 households with this mechanism. <coughs> so to wrap up, um, some key considerations that we are following, Save the Children will include appropriate child, child safeguarding measures at every phase within every activity. We will include appropriate measures to mitigate increased risk of gender-based violence, particularly to protect women and girls from sexual exploitation. As you may know, this is a, a risk for them in, in this context. Also, we ensure assessment and monitoring data uh, to identify the needs, the rights violation and experiences of children. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alec, Alejandra. Uh, Alexandra. Um, I'm actually going to uh, uh, consolidate a number of questions that came out in the chat box that I'd hope you you can address, and and they're they're combined. One is around what type of capacity development you've needed to provide to staff to adapt to these uh, modifications, and then also if you could, and then just after that. Uh, discuss the utilization of qualitative data in, in this process to any extent. Thank you, Lloyd. So what type of capacity developments we have to uh, give to staff to adapt to, to these modifications? So first of all, for, for us, was, um, was not hard to adapt to a more remote work because uh, we already had many mechanisms in place, such as um, service by phone, um, also um, technical assistance by, by phone or, or through Zoom. And, but it's important to train, to train the staff to use these new mechanisms, such as I mentioned the phone service, and, and go through a risk and mitigation plan. Uh, so, so uh, everyone can know how to mitigate these new strategies. So I, I will suggest uh, to, to train the staff in new mechanisms, in the new strategies and be very, very creative. And, and regarding the, the next question, the utilization of qualitative data. Well, well first of all, um, it's important in this context to, to use a secondary data in the first place. So uh, not necessarily go to the field to collect the information, but as qualitative data may be important in some cases, we, we recommend not to um, organize, for example, focus groups, right? It, it, it wouldn't be a great idea at the moment, but you can collect information through um, interviews in depth to key informants. So uh, the, the, the main way to do this will be uh, if you want to collect information through secondary data or qualitative way with interviews. Right now, we are, we are not going uh, to the field to collect uh, qualitative information. And as I mentioned also for the evaluation, we will uh, maybe delay the qualitative part, but we will uh, advance on the quantitative part. So I would recommend also this. A brief follow-up and, and maybe the last question and this is another question that was posed is uh, with that focus on the quantitative is is that having implications on your team's back-end analysis and, and the types of questions they're attempting to answer with that data? Um, so I, I don't know if I, I um, understand completely so using quantitative uh, data for the evaluation or for for what exactly? 
Uh, for, for internal monitoring purposes, less so for the evaluation, but actually driving uh, the adaptation of the program for COVID-19 world. Yes, so the information we are collecting at the moment, and, and we collected it also in, in March, uh, during already the government restriction was the PDM, the post distribution monitoring, that helps us um, know the progress of our indi quantitative indicators. And, and this was key to do these interviews because uh, we got to talk with the beneficiaries that were already um, going through these re movement restrictions and not being able to work. It was, uh, well, very interesting to know uh, what what were their problems at the time. Uh, uh, and so I, I would recommend also reaching out to the beneficiaries in this way. And for the quantitative indicators also, it's important to analyze this information to see if we have to adapt it in some way to add some new um, follow-up follow questions maybe in the evaluation. So it's important also to review what indicators we are we are able to measure at the moment and what we we should include thank you so much for your presentation today uh maya i will hand it over to you thank you thank you so much both um it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker amina ferrati she is president of International Advisory Products and Systems, or IAPS, which is a woman-owned and managed consulting firm that leverages global expertise with local presence to transform organizations and communities into partners of change for change. Amina oversees IAPS work globally, focusing on monitoring and evaluation, third-party monitoring, knowledge management, and capacity building. So uh, over to you, Amina. Thank you, Maya. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining on this uh, really timely topic. So as Maya mentioned, um, for us at IAPS, um, we focus uh, primarily on monitoring and evaluation, third party monitoring, capacity building and knowledge management. Um, we work across the humanitarian to development continuum uh, by providing these services and um, provide um, this monitoring and evaluating in um, several sectors, including food security, agriculture, livelihoods, um, wash and uh, global health. Um, um, one of the issues um, and approaches of how we do our work is we really try to take a people-driven approach that leverages the principles and science behind human-centered design um, to ensure our work is actually people first. Um, and that's part of how we're attempting to navigate and respond to COVID and adapt um, just as many of your organizations are. Um, and just by way of reference, since 2012, we worked in 25 countries and have supported over 80 clients in um, conducting nearly half a million surveys. Next slide. So I think as we've heard from the other speakers today, the current COVID pandemic environment is incredibly complex, um, as we've seen from the survey, um, as well as the presentations. As a provider of third-party monitoring services who really focuses in non-permissive areas, um, such as Syria, Yemen, Iraq, um, and Honduras, and many other countries across the Middle East and Northern Africa region, we are um, familiar um, in terms of uh, maintaining flexibility in our approach, but at the same time, um, we have certainly found that um, being able to conduct TPM um, work and our experiences are both an asset in terms of adaptation, but also a limitation. Um, and just from what I've seen from many of the questions that are posed today, really, um, how do we adapt some of these methodologies to populations that don't have access to phones, um, that have lower literacy, um, that have different gender contexts? Um, and so certainly those are really important contexts. Um, what we found is that just on a meta level, um, COVID is requiring a full scale adaptation that um, impacts everyone from the individual to the community to the organizational level, whether that's the program, the donor, or a third party monitor like ourselves um, to the national level um, in terms of government and infrastructure. 
Um, and that includes both the restrictions on country movement, but also how we change and plan and adapt and how we train our staff and their willingness and interest and safety in being able to work. Next slide. So um, for us at IAPS, what we did was we provided a rapid response survey to ME and TPM professionals um, spanning about 30 different countries. And um, we're still collecting those responses now, so I'll be sure to send out a link to the survey. Um, we would love to capture your input. But so far, some of those responses highlight the realities that ME and TPM providers are having. Um, we did the survey in Arabic, English, French, and Spanish, so we got a range of responses. And as you can see, these are just um, a, a snapshot of what we're seeing, which is that for providers of third-party monitoring, um, many of us were already working in non-permissive contexts that were humanitarian disasters or conflict settings. Those areas were already harsh, and COVID is adding an additional burden to that. Um, there's also the possibility to leverage systems of data that already exist on the ground. Um, and those, for example, include partnering with local organizations. They include identifying community liaisons who can act as um, a proxy in cases where you can't get access on the ground. And perhaps when access improves um, as an aggregator of data. Um, we're also finding from a lot of our partners that they're delaying certain types of data collection, similar um, to what um, the partners just shared a few minutes ago. And that, um, importantly, to get the experience of field staff, who are the ones who actually often are the enumerators, they go out and collect the data, and they're that critical link um, in terms of data integrity and our knowledge management is that those field staff are often really stressed. Um, so just as we're stressed at the program or headquarter level, field staff are um, stressed on multiple levels of, um, in terms of their personal safety, their desire for personal protective equipment, um, which may or may not be able to be procured and in line with guidelines. Um, and at the same time, they're also scared about their ability to continue working since um, you know, there's a it's, it's a significant shift to sift um, surveys and um, trainings from in person to um, doing it remote, such as via phone, where that's an option. Um, as a third party monitoring provider, um, we're finding ourselves um, realizing that we're increasing the use of remote technology for staff, um, even though we often already included that um, in our work in non-permissive settings, but that there's also increased costs um, with that in terms of shifting and reprogramming and redoing trainings. Um, and that um, there's some real concerns about um, response rates when conducting surveys. Um, just as we in our personal lives have um, a lot of stress and concerns about how we personally adapt to COVID, um, beneficiaries and key informants are no different in that sense. Next slide. So in line with that, um, what we've done at IAPS is we're really excited that yesterday we released um, our first version of guidance on how to adapt third-party monitoring in the context of this current COVID pandemic. And we work with Dr. Lynn Lowry um, of the uh, Uniform Services University of Health Sciences, as well as um, senior professors and researchers with Johns Hopkins University. And we also validated some of our recommendations um, by conducting key informants, um, as well as gathering input from ME and TPM professionals in over eight countries, including those in non-permissive settings. You can find the full document um, at the link on your screen, which is available on IOPS website. And here I want to iterate that similar to the partners at Save the Children and IRC, really the foundation of this document centers on adhering to the principles of do no harm. And that extends across from the donor to the program to the third party, per, um, third party monitoring provider like ourselves and the application of that to our staff. In doing so, we identify some key overarching principles that we think are really critical, um, which is that information is paramount. Um, so staff need to have access to the public health information and understand the risk that they're exposed to or may be exposed to. Um, we also have to be willing to modify approaches that I'll talk about in a few minutes about what those options mean. 
Um, but then of course, there's no one size fits all. Um, COVID is extremely complex. It's impacting us globally, but it's also impacting us at multiple levels. And so because of that, we're requiring multiple levels of adaptation. Um, and that those adaptations have to be iterative. What might work now um, in designing a survey may not be valid in seven days when a country moves to perhaps um, stricter uh, movement restrictions. Next slide. So here you'll see a screenshot and some more details um, regarding the different um, methodologies that we're suggesting for the guidance. So we've broken our guidance down into four phases, um, and that's the phases that we often follow as third party practitioners, and many of the monitoring and evaluation phases fall under these same umbrellas. And that's desk review, inception, um, methodologies and modalities that you see on the screen there, um, as well as data validation and reporting. And the goal here is to present um, recommendations and considerations of what could be adapted, um, what might be the options you might pursue. So if you're working in a high literacy environment, you may be able to do um, SMS, um, a text message surveys. Um, on the other hand, if you're working in a non-permissive settings in which community trust might be a challenge, um, and the beneficiaries themselves may not have access to phones, you might be looking at using a community liaison as a proxy. Um, that's something that we've done um, in the past with IOPS in terms of third party monitoring in contexts like Syria. And that has helped um, to both gather data that might not otherwise be available by conducting larger surveys. Um, I also want to flag that on this slide, you also see that there is an important emphasis on the interconnectedness um, between an intervention um, uh, and some of the, um, uh, uh, rather, some of the connectors and dividers. Um, and so the intent here is to just acknowledge that this is really complex. Um, and so it's a continuous and fluid environment that requires uh, multiple levels of adaptation. And then um, you don't see it on the slide, but it is in the full document available on our website. Um, this also um, goes down to the adaptations we need in reporting. Um, I think a number of um, questions have posed limitations about the validity of um, the data, the data integrity. And so um, certainly for us at IOPS, um, we have experience um, conducting data integrity checks at the remote level, but there are limitations um, if survey and sample sizes are really reduced. So I think those are all important critical um, factors to build into both the planning, but also the reporting basis. So um, I'll stop there and I would again encourage um, folks to um, check the link on our website. Again, this is iterative, so this is the first version, and certainly as we continue to learn um, with our colleagues, we'll be adapting it going forward. Thanks so much, Amina. Uh, that, was, that was great. Uh, one, a few questions have come up, but one from uh, Lenovo T450, which happens to be a computer I'm very familiar <laughs> with, uh, but the question from them is, can you explain the possibility of collecting data from remote locations that do not have access to telephone services, e.g. Congo, South Sudan, Somalia. You alluded a little bit to this, but if you could maybe discuss what the practicalities behind that look like, um, I think it would be helpful for all of us. Yeah. So for us, I would say it's a, it's a tough question and one that we um, ourselves are trying to tackle. Um, one of the approaches that we found um, that has potential in some of those settings is to identify um, a community liaison. So that might be an individual that um, might be identified by a partner organization um, or by the third party monitoring group themselves. Um, and you can equip that person with a phone and they can be used as an aggregator to um, gather information um, from the beneficiaries or community members themselves where those community members don't individually have access to a phone. Um, there might also be opportunities to have phone points where there's a shared phone. Now, of course, in a COVID context, that raises other risk considerations. And so I think the challenge is um, there's really no easy answer to that. And that's something that we're evaluating as well. And in, in, in those situations where people do have access to phones, uh, and, and, and again, I understand that this is evolving given the, the COVID context, but how would you rate across context the kind of the reachability of beneficiary, especially in these non-permissive settings, 
regarding the quality of the calls, their ability to take calls, and, and any potential uh, bias this has on your on your remote or third party monitoring. Yeah. So, you know, I think the important thing is that the approach has to be modified from planning to deployment to analysis. So that means that the enumerators that we use, they're going to be trained differently when they're conducting a phone interview. Um, they're going to be trained on how to um, collect that consent and how to um, get uh, an individual to respond to the questions and remain on it. You're going to design the survey questions differently. They're going to have to be significantly shorter um, than what you can do in person. There's also the issue of rapport, um, which can get, of course, individuals to provide information, particularly in qualitative interviews. And so that's a nuance that um, you have to build into your training um, with your enumerators for them to be able to convey that on the phone. Just as we have challenges conveying presentations in a remote setting, it's no different when you're trying to ask a beneficiary to open up and provide information to you. Um, and then um, I would say um, the other piece is, um, you know, I think certainly in terms of limitations, um, you know, I know there can be challenges with determining if an individuals are able to provide um, that um, answers to a survey and if they're in a safe place. And those are issues that I think you just have to identify as limitations in the reporting. Um, there's an element when you do the work remotely that um, we are not going to be able to visibly see. And so that could be a, a one. And then the last thing I'll add is what we found to be really effective at IOPS um, is that we hire um, uh, enumerators directly ourselves and we hire them directly from the community. So that's how you get at the community acceptance and the trust. Um, and I think that's also how we can help bridge um, some of the hesitancy or limitations of um, uh, key informants or beneficiaries wanting to complete these types of surveys and wanting to provide this type of data while they themselves are struggling to respond in a crisis or pandemic environment. And so it's that local connection and trust that's really critical. Great, thank you. I, one, one question actually just popped up and I think it's very relevant and given uh, your organization's experience in the past, are you specifically drawing uh, lessons from previous ep uh, epidemics or pandemics, like for for example, uh, Ebola? And if so, what are those lessons learned that you're kind of seeing across these different uh, these different uh, environments, these global issues? Yeah. So definitely we're looking, um, you know, I think at resources that were produced by our, um, both um, our internal experience, having done um, a social behavior change um, in response to Ebola, for example, in Sierra Leone, as well as um, the World Health Organization um, whole of society uh, pandemic preparedness approach is also really important. And there's a couple things. Um, so one, I think, is recognizing the interconnectedness that I mentioned and that we've included in our guidelines. Um, and it might seem easy to put on paper, but it's really hard in practicality. Um, and I think second is um, recognizing that initially, for example, when we looked at COVID, the initial response is to, of course, push content out to the community and educate them about the risk. And one of the things that we learned from Ebola is that um, social stigma, and particularly for vulnerable populations who are already vulnerable, can um, be really critical. And so it requires you to adapt your communications to um, mitigate the risk of increasing stigma amongst particular populations. And so that's something that we've taken. Um, but then, of course, as I said, this is iterative. I think we are all learning together in this environment. And so we're, of course, um, really interested to see how other colleagues and partners um, respond. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I think we have time for one more, uh, Maya Selmi. And, and I'm going to read. I, I, this is an interesting one uh, in terms of respond, respondent bias, and I, I'm interested in your take. So Jane, Jenna Fox says, uh, people who may not have considered themselves vulnerable pre-COVID-19 and would have responded to surveys positively, um, I'm assuming that means like they would have happily responded, may not respond, may now respond quite differently, even though the project intervention was not so different. Mm -hmm. How can I now rely on my survey data or else how can I take out the COVID-19 bias of, of respondents? Uh, and so I think it's largely around what that, you know, willingness to partake 
in, in surveys and what that potential bias means to our data and how we interpret it. Yeah, so um, I can. I think it's a really great question um, and certainly one that um, we are definitely considering as we move to conduct, for example, um, a midline data collection um, on a program that was already being implemented pre-COVID. Um, and so I, I know that um, one example is to integrate the questions about the shock um, that COVID might be having. Um, and to also uh, try to triangulate that data um, during the analysis period and to see how it compares um, with perhaps um, baseline or the online data um, to see the effect. But I think from um, uh, you know, a scientific rigor point of view, um, it's definitely a challenge. And I know that's something that um, our data analysis team is looking at and, and trying to figure out ways um, to, to mitigate that risk or acknowledge those limitations. Thank you so much, Amina. Great, thank you. Thank you uh, to all the speakers, Simon, Amina, and Alexandra, and all the 500 people who joined. Uh, the response to this event exceeded our expectations and has really highlighted, I think, the need uh, and the importance of m and &E and all NGO sectors to connect, share, and learn from each other in this new and quite uncertain time. Lloyd. I forgot to unmute myself. I, I, I myself am, am very much looking forward to the follow-on activities uh, where we can explore some of some of these discussions and the technical aspects of it in, in a bit more detail and uh, with you know slightly smaller uh, audience at times and we'll uh, uh, yes <laughs> but to that end please take the poll that you should see popping up on, on your screen now so we can begin to get a sense of which topics discussed today, uh, either by the presenters in the, in the Q&A or even that you raised as part of your registration that we can begin to focus and highlight on for future events uh, under IDEAL. Yes, and I want to highlight two really important things here. I see people are dropping off now. Before you go, please, please, please fill up the poll and also take our evaluation of this event. We'd love to get your feedback on this event in particular. So we'll post the link to the evaluation in the chat box before you go. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that we have started an online forum where you can all take some of this discussion and continue the, the, the talking, the exchanging of ideas, links, all that. Um, the address to that forum is discourse.fsnnetwork.org. It will be posted in the chat box right now. Um, so please head over there. It's brand new, so you won't see a lot there yet, but we're counting on you to, to engage in a discussion and fill that space up. Uh, yeah, Lloyd, I don't know if you want to say more about the space there. Uh, please go. Uh, one of our administrator for that, uh, our, who manages um, our setting up communities of practice, Chris Riggs, he gets really excited when anyone posts on it right now. So I really want him to wake up one morning and go, oh my gosh, there's too many people posting. I can't have these notifications. So <laughs> it, it would really make my day if, if, if we could do that. Um, it's a, a discourse in general is a, just a great forum for conversations across sectors over time, communities, time zones. Um, so please engage. I also wanna encourage everybody to stay connected with Ideal. Uh, if you like this event, if you wanna see more like this, this is my marketing pitch, please go subscribe to our newsletter, uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, and we will definitely be reaching out about future events such as these. And another thing, uh, if you have resources you wanna share with the broader community, uh, events that we can post in our newsletter, accomplishments, tools, please let us know, uh, share. Uh, we have a content submission form on our website, fsnnetwork.org. So go there and, and reach out to us. There's also an email address. Uh, you will reach Kim, who is also on the, uh, on the webinar here. So, so please do share and we'll make sure to spread it out to the, to the broader community. And this is my last push. Uh, all of us on here, all 500, well now there's uh...
Now there's 383 left. We are all evaluators. Let's go evaluate. Please, uh, the evaluation is posted in the box. It's, it's really easy. It's ideal.events forward slash eval. It is a two minute survey. Uh, I believe it's only four, maybe five questions. Take it, let us know your frank feedback so we can make the next one better. This is our first one of the size. So we know that there's going to be opportunities to improve this engagement. Please, please, please go evaluate us. We're all evaluators. Support evaluation. Take that. It's short. It's sweet. Um, and you would make my day. You would make our team's day because that's our job is to go in and look at these things, frankly. Uh, and last, you know, Maya, somehow I've made it 90 minutes today. And I did not make one single corny April Fool's joke. <laughs> I, that is right. You surprised me. I was expecting something from you. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll save it for next year. I'll, okay. I'll make sure we do two next year. Sounds good. All right. With that, thank you so much, everybody. We'll close this now. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good luck.